So a very warm welcome to everyone joining live today and those catching up on demand. Please use the chat box to introduce who you are, from which organization and where in the world are you joining from. We are expecting people from all over the world to uh, be present today in this session. And also, please, you may use the chat function to add comments and questions and answers um, <clears throat> for the panel. Um, so please let me uh, first uh, introduce this session on mobile money innovations to empower consumers, which is part of our Fair Digital Finance Forum, an event that started yesterday and will go until next Friday. Our panel today is this one, and, and I want to show you the pictures of those who are um, participating. Our moderator is Anne Piexelon. Uh, Anne is recognized as uh, in the 2019 in Emerging Payments Award Contributor of the Year and a senior leader under the Innovate Finance Woman in Playtech Power List. Anne champions diversity and end user interest. She's an ambassador for the Payments Association and a judge for the prestigious Payment Association and European Women's Payment Network Award. She's also an advocate for Her Majesty Treasury's Woman in the Finance Charter. Thank you very much for being here and, and also uh, to that you accepted to be the moderator. And our um, panelists today will be uh, Rose Bofu. Rose is the Chief Executive Officer of the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe and also a member of Consumers International Council. Rosemary was appointed as a Consumer Protection Commissioner and worked closely with the Commission to ensure the proper implementation of the Consumer Protection Act in Zimbabwe. Also, uh, we have Lara Crow. Lara leads MPESA's product innovation in credit, insurance, savings, and wealth management. Is responsible for the teams developing platforms with the seven MPESA markets can commercialize. Laura has been at Vodafone for 13 years with other roles dedicated to their emerging market footprint in consumer services and external affairs. We have also Maria Lucia Leitown. Maria Lucia is the head of the Banking Conduct Supervision Department at the Central Bank of Portugal since its inception in 2011. She's also the chair of the steering committee of the Portuguese National Strategy for Financial Education. And at the international level, Maria Lucia is the chair of ThinkConnect, the International Financial Consumer Protection Organization and member of the advisory board of OECD INFP, the International Network on Finance Education. And uh, our last speaker is Brian Muthiora. Brian is the regulatory director for the GSME mobile money program. He leads the global mobile money policy and regulatory practice, providing tailored support to mobile money operators. He also leads TSME's mobile money regulatory engagements, working with several financial regulators across Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the MENA. Without further delay, I hand in this uh, session to our moderator, Anne. Thank you very much, Antonio Nino. Um, thank you for bringing us together. And I'd just like to say to everyone here and to the audience that uh, Happy World Consumer Rights Day. It's actually um, today is our anniversary. So I'd just like to say that. Um, right, I'd like to say thank welcome to the panelists. The purpose of this session is for the Fair Digital Finance Forum to bring together digital finance leading voices. And I'm really pleased to be joined by the panelists that we've got here today who have got a great pedigree to actually discuss this today. So we've got consumer interests, governments, good business interests being represented and regulators. The forum aims, aims to actually generate debate and to motivate both panel members and attendees to think about how we can accelerate progress towards fair digital finance. To do that, we need to ensure that consumers remain protected and the business community has the ability to act as a catalyst for change. So the format of this session will be, I'll, I'll, I'll cover the topics that we will explore later, but I'm going to outline the format. Firstly, I'm going to ask the expert panel 
to have some individual questions that will set the scene. We will then move on to a more informal discussion around some key themes and we will have a Q&A session. As Antoninino's um, slide actually said, we've asked you to raise some, raise some question, Q and A's via our chat box. And I would strongly ask you to do that if you could say where you're from, but also if you've got a particular panelist that you would like that question to be directed to, because the more interactive we can make the session, the better for all of us. So the topics that we're actually going to be covering, the session's titled Mobile Money, Innovations and Inclusion. What we're going to explore is how mobile money is brought about financial inclusion and consumer empowerment and what has the impact that money, mobile money has had on reducing gender financial inclusion. We're then we're going to go on to how recent innovations have accelerated change and we will discuss examples of the most successful consumer-centered business models. We're look, going to look at what protections there are for consumers and are there any other benefits such as increasing financial capabilities? And finally, we're going to look at the opportunities for collaborative action amongst interested parties, such as consumer bodies, businesses, policymakers, and regulators, to deliver more products for consumer choice and to ensure that adequate protections are in place. So we've got a lot to get through. I want to first, I Antonius Nino's actually provided you an outline of why I'm here, but I just wanted to give you to set the scene. Why I'm here is because my background is actually in product design, implementation, but also ongoing delivery in the payment space. I was previously director of product and strategy at Fax Payment Schemes. And what I learned there was the payments arena actually covers a large number of different needs across the end-to-end community. I'm extremely passionate about ensuring that consumers, and particularly those that are financially vulnerable for different reasons, and that could be gender, a topic we're going to cover, have access to a range of products and services to help them manage their finances. We're going through significant change within the payments arena. And with the advent of open banking, there will be greater access to a range of products and services that sit above the existing payment schemes. For example, here in the UK, we're now being encouraged to pay our taxes via our mobile, via access to our bank accounts. The underlying payment scheme, however, in this case, still faster payments. However, it could be a card transaction. We are also seeing a rise in buy now and pay later products, BMPL, which we will cover in our discussions. So what's the benefits? Well, the benefits to the consumer are that I can now pay my bills by my mobile and the benefits to the businesses are that it's more streamlined payment flow. This could lead to more competitive products and greater savings and reduce costs. The greater risk, however, is that some consumers may be left behind. However, if we actually get this right, mobile money and digital financial products could give us the opportunity to enable anyone who has access to a phone or a computer the ability to transact online. But to do that, I strongly believe that we all need to work together as a community. We need to ensure that we work together and do not leave anyone behind. And if that something goes wrong, that we have the adequate protections for the consumers and users in place. So that was going to be me setting the scene. What I'd now like to actually write, to hand over to um, Maria Lucia, who chairs the fin FinConnect, the network of financial regulators from around the world. So she can give you a, a view from her perspective. And Maria, for regulators, there are challenges to address consumer protection issues related with digital financial services. In your view, Maria, what are those challenges and how are the regulators dealing with them? And I'd also like to know if you see any possibilities for synergies with consumer groups and other stakeholders in defining policies and developing regulation for digital financial services. 
Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for the, the question. Uh, and I'm very pleased to answer your question. But uh, allow me to mention, first of all, that uh, I'm also very pleased to be here today. And uh, on behalf of FinConnet, uh, I would like to thank for, for this invitation, for the opportunity to bring uh, also a FinConnet perspective to this so important topic, because we, are, we all know that not only payments, but uh, the evolution of digital financial services services is, is growing enormously. And we know that with unfolding of, of this pandemic, uh, the, we uh, are seeing a, an increasing role of uh, and weight of digital financial services. Uh, and let me uh, uh, come back to the FinConnet program of work, because uh, FinConnet as an international organization on financial consumer protection, and as an international organization which gathers business conduct supervised authorities from all around the globe, I would say. Uh, and obviously, let me also allow to mention, to recall that uh, Consumers International is an observer uh, at FinConnet, and we are very pleased with uh, uh, the active role of Consumers International in our uh, different initiatives. But as I said, uh, as, um, uh, uh, as uh, from the inception uh, of FinConnet in 2014, we immediately after decided to create a standing committee to discuss the impact uh, of the growing evolution of online and mobile payments and the challenges brought by that evolution to business conduct supplied authorities. And actually, uh, I was very pleased at the time to be, to be the chair of the standing committee who produced two reports. And uh, one report uh, in 2016 and another one uh, in 2018. And uh, yesterday, <laughs> I read again the conclusions, takeaways of these reports. And I think they are very much in line with what I would be saying today, which is uh, we realized that it's very, very important to have an ongoing uh, monitorization of the evolution of digital financial services and payments. Obviously, it's a very important segment and first one to, to be digitalized, if I can uh, use this expression. And, um, uh, and uh, we need to have a, a very comprehensive uh, legal and regulatory framework in place to mitigate risks, uh, obviously, uh, arising from use of digital financial services, because we all know that uh, uh, digitalization of financial services uh, brings a lot of opportunities to consumers because they can have a convenient access, a faster access. Uh, they can enjoy also uh, the access to more tailored products. And obviously they can have functionalities to monitor on, 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 on real time their financial position. But we know it comes with <laughs> at a price and the price are the recent challenges. The risks are very much related with cybersecurity risks. This is that it was the risk that we addressed in, in the report uh, uh, we produced at Fincon 1816. Um, and the risks obviously linked with cybersecurity risks, but also with security risks, phishing, social engineering, more and more, and uh, uh, account taking and uh, data and personal theft. All those risks are, uh, they need to be uh, obviously mitigated. We never can overcome all those risks, but we need to mitigate those risks uh, by having a very comprehensive uh, uh, real, uh, 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 legal and regulatory framework. Um, uh, but we also know that uh, apart from the risks, there are challenges for supervised authorities. Challenges related to the fact that, first of all, we know that going digital, it can exacerbate some, some uh, behavioral biases. We know that that uh, consumers, uh, they may be tempted to buy by impulse and then they can uh, get access uh, um, to credit. Um, maybe this is some uh, the insights from, from the economics. They need also to be taken into consideration and design uh, an adequate legal and regulatory framework. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, let me mention that the regulatory authorities, they have also challenges related to the need to have a legal and regulatory framework with a very balanced approach, uh, take into consideration need to protect consumers and at the same time to allow for innovation. And the innovation has to be flexible because obviously and dynamic, then the regulatory framework has also to be flexible and dynamic. 
Uh, but uh, there are important points that the legal and regulatory um, framework, uh, if you allow me, uh, I would like to suggest that need to be taken into consideration. One is uh, what we call technological neutrality. Uh, consumers, when going through digital channels, they need to be granted same rights they, they, they can get when they go over the counter through a branch. Um, then uh, there is a need to adjust uh, how those rights should be implemented. For instance, we need to take into consideration that the principle of disclosure of information is also to be uh, taken into consideration when going digital or through a mobile, but that it has to be adjusted to digital uh, uh, environment. Um, but uh, the right of assistance, it's very important uh, to consider that um, going digital, consumers, they are completely alone. They do not have the employee at the branch helping them to solve questions or to explain things. And to have a, an adequate framework uh, to uh, provide right of assistance to consumers is also very, very important. Uh, but uh, we also know that uh, issues related with the increase in cross-border transactions when those transactions are conducted through digital channels can also raise um, uh, issues because the legal and regulatory framework I would say the protection granted to consumers may not be the same according to the, the country where the head of the, that provider is located. Uh, and at the same time, <laughs> there are other issues related with the need to allow for the access uh, to consumers to electronic uh, complaints handling and redress mechanisms. These are some of, the, of the, the, the issues that the legal and regulatory framework should take into consideration. And obviously, there is another one which is very dependent on the, the national um, context, which is uh, the supervisory perimeter. Uh, as uh, you know, in Europe, based on uh, um, the the service, uh, the payment service directive, uh, all those providers should be within the supervisory perimeter, and it's what we have in Portugal. Even these uh, new um, third party providers, initiators, and aggregators of current accounts and so on, they need to be registered at supervised authority as payment institutions or supervisory, or sorry, or electronic money institutions. But this is legal and regulatory framework. But just one more point, I will stop. Uh, because after the regulatory framework, there is a need to, and an action for supervised authorities. And this is where FinConnect comes. We are business conduct supervised authorities, and then we need to oversee uh, the implementation, obviously at national level, according to the specific legal and regulatory framework, um, how it's going to be uh, uh, implemented by the institutions. And thirdly, to empower consumers, <laughs> we need to also uh, rely on support of those that are implementing financial literacy. We at Bank of Portugal, we work based on these three pillars, regulation, um, oversight, and financial literacy. And we work uh, taking the, these three pillars to develop a comprehensive um, uh, financial consumer protection uh, framework. But in, anyway, I, I, I understood that you want to, to ask questions. Sorry. That's extremely comprehensive, and we are due to have Rose join us, who will actually be whose experiences around consumer protections. I think some of the key points I've picked up on that, um, Maria, uh, uh, Maria, is actually around ensuring a competitive pro, uh, landscape, ensuring there is appropriate regulation, and I think uh, the word appropriate is very, very key because um, inadequate. A regulation can stifle innovation. However, I also picked up that you talk very talk about the importance of consumer bodies that working together with the reg regulators, and that's a topic that we will come on to next. Um, and also around edu appropriate reg education, that could be a topic of a session. <laughs> I'm not going to actually, I, I will sum up at, right at the end of this, but I think we'll come back to some of the questions that you raised here in our open questions, but I'll come back to Laura now. Laura is the head of financial services at MPISA, a, a leading fintech in um, uh, Africa. Laura, welcome. Um, Laura, we've heard the view from uh, 
Maria from a regulator point of view. We'd now like to really hear from yourself as business. Now, when Maria talked about the regulators and innovation, et cetera, we're particularly interested to understand about the challenges to address consumer protection issues related with mobile stroke digital finance services. And how can companies develop products and services that are actually consumer centered? Bearing in mind that obviously companies are there to actually have a, a business requirement. Um, and finally, could you provide us with any um, examples? Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to present today um, a little bit of insight from um, Impesa's experience. Um, so um, for those on the call, Impesa is one of the kind of pioneers and leaders in mobile money. Um, so we have over 50 million customers now across seven of our markets. Um, and I know a lot of the, the kind of overarching topic today is how kind of mobile money itself has supported financial inclusion. Um, but I guess given that we've had such a big role in that to date, um, I'm keen to talk particularly around our, our kind of newer products and services, um, particularly in the, the credit space. So um, likewise, we've also been a pioneer here to enable um, access to digital finance. Um, and our journey even there started um, probably about a decade ago. Um, and here we've been able to prove that using customers' mobile money transaction data, um, as well as their, their mobile phone data, has been able to provide a useful input into being able to decide on a customer's credit worthiness and then give them much better access to, to credit. Um, and over the kind of the last financial year, um, we as a, a mobile money provider, we actually enabled over $4 billion worth of loans. So, um, you know, we're able to provide, uh, enable kind of products at, at mass scale. Um, now, in terms of the question, I mean, consumer, like consumer centric design is at the heart um, of our kind of product development process. And, and it really is at the heart, I think, of all kind of fintechs um, and, or, um, you know, agile product release development processes is to have that human centered design. So we do a lot of kind of research within the field. We do um, a lot of kind of mock-ups in terms of what our potential hypotheses are and get customer feedback around some of those um, before we then start to iterate some of those product designs, um, put them into beta format, get further feedback, and then build on more and more features um, relevant to, to our customers. I think also what's important about from kind of the human centered design elements in, in our product development is also we really have, to, we do take ourselves um, that we have to think responsibly about kind of these types of products. Um, sometimes you can even see um, from our data that customers might not even be super aware of pricing or they might be kind of price inelastic because they've had so little access to some of these services to date. Um, and so that means, you know, we, we want to kind of be stick thinking maybe even a step above um, sometimes what even our customers are asking um, and start to install kind of key principles. Um, so what we've been developing at the moment is actually a, a credit marketplace where we can easily bring more financial institutions to, to plug and play um, and provide more products. And the, the purpose of doing that is to bring more choice um, and transparency to customers. And so in doing that marketplace play, there's a number of kind of principles we've put at the heart of it. So one is um, ex customer's exposure. So if they're taking credit um, out through us, the, the amount of credit exposure within that platform is available to everyone. Um, and that's really important in terms of trying to reduce over indebtedness. Um, and it's something unfortunately we hadn't had in some of our earlier rounds of products. We just didn't have that visibility across institutions in terms of what customers were, were leveraging. We've also um, 
done other elements. So we've tried to improve the, the transparency of the, the T's and C's um, for customers to, to see. Um, we've even kind of put some friction into the journey, something that a lot of providers want to do friction less payments. But on the credit side, we've actually done a bit more friction. So customers are really sure that they, they want to um, take out that product and can get more access to, to the cost and pricing to be able to compare to, to different providers. Um, we also um, have changed our kind of uh, model in terms of upselling. So we can only upsell um, in this platform to what a customer asks for. So rather than just setting an overarching limit, which might be a lot higher than what a customer came in to, to, to ask to borrow, um, we actually have a, an upsell approach that's within a certain percentage of what the customer has actually asked. Another key kind of principle on the, the platform is around risk-based pricing. Um, again, probably a wider debate in terms of that and financial inclusion. Um, but the principle here is we do risk-based pricing on credit um, with the idea to try and um, really support um, for our good payers being able to access um, lower rates of credit and not have kind of, as in our previous um, iterations where, you know, arguably, um, good payers are subsidizing the bad payers. Um, so there's a number of different kind of uh, actions that we're doing, um, and we're actually um, got kind of more in the roadmap to try and um, enhance even more kind of uh, features uh, within the, the platform, because really for us, you know, an intuitive product, a transparent product is what drives customer adoption. Um, if there isn't that trust in the product, they're not going to use it. And so we really have to, to foster it. So it's really, a, you know, kind of in line with what we want to achieve. Um, there is also a number of thing, actions we want to do kind of beyond just us as a business and cross collaborate with regulators um, and with other organizations. Um, I can talk to that now, or if you're keen for a bit more interactive, maybe we'll, we'll hand over and come back to that. Thank you very much, Laura. I've really am interested in what you're saying about the responsible principles that you're actually embedding into your product design. Um, I've seen so many times when someone's had a good idea based on tech, and we delivered that and actually haven't understood the impacts on the end user. And speaking of which, we're now being joined by, we will, we will, we will obviously explore those other areas that you'll talk about later in our general discussion. Um, we've now been joined by Rose. Rose, thank you very much. I know you're extremely busy. Um, Rose, actually, I'm going to turn to you now, if that's OK, um, because we've heard from Maria and we've heard from Laura. Rose has vast experience in consumer protections, and I think it's really good that she's actually following on from what you just said there, Laura, um, and in digital finance in Zimbabwe. Um, Rose, so mobile money is actually helping consumers to have access to financial services, but there is a need to discuss how consumer rights can be adequately protected to avoid problems. Rose, can you share your views and share with us what is happening in Zimbabwe and also share your views about how gender issues and inclusion can be addressed? Thank you very much, Anne, for this opportunity. Um, indeed, consumers need to be protected in a great way in Zimbabwe. I will share with you a little bit about the efforts that we are making as consumer advocates in Zimbabwe. Uh, first of all, um, in 2019, in December, uh, the Consumer Protection Act was enacted. It, it was a bill, so it was enacted into law. So now we do have a Consumer Protection Act. It's now law for consumers to be protected. Uh, and it provides for the formation of the Consumer Protection Commission. And so soon after its launch, last year in 2021, we then got the act to be, you know, implemented. The commission was uh, then appointed. So far, we have eight commissioners out of the 12 who are supposed to be there. Um, so the commission is now working hand in hand with the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. 
particularly in terms of consumer education. Uh, when we actually look at the fair digital finance services uh, theme for this year, just today in the morning, we had a symposium which drew together regulators across sectors. So we had the, the central bank regulators, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. We also had the Bankers Association of Zimbabwe represented. We had the ZimSwitch, who are the custodians of mobile money. Um, we also had the commission itself, the Consumer Protection Commission. We had um, representatives of consumer bodies. We do have, if you remember, we have what we call consumer action clubs. So we had representatives of the various consumer action clubs, as well as the elderly consumers. We also had the people living with disability. They were there and they also made presentations. So all these people made presentations. Our guest of honor was the deputy minister of ICT uh, and Curia Services. He, he gave a keynote address and uh, it was very important. We had postal and telecommunications regulators of Zimbabwe, we call them POTRAS. They were there, they also articulated the various issues that um, affect consumers and the various efforts that they, as the regulators are making to try and ensure that consumers are protected. Um, so you find that the issues really came out very clearly. Regulators are making a lot of effort. Technology is moving ahead uh, in financial services, but consumers are being left behind. So we are making um, a lot of engagement to try and ensure that consumers should be engaged, should be educated. So the issue of consumer education came out very clearly that consumers need to be educated to be able to follow and to, you know, to work together with technology so that they are not left behind. Uh, when it comes to mobile money, it's a very, very thorny issue for us as Zimbabwe because you find that people in rural areas, some of them do not have access to the relevant technology. Some of them are not even banked. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have cell phones. They, you know, they have to use money to get onto buses, into town to get money, using money to get money. So it's a lot of cost, unnecessary cost. Now with technology, we should be, we should enhance the use of technology. We should, uh, we should educate consumers so that everyone becomes banked, so that everyone can make use of the necessary technology in order to make their livelihoods a lot easier. So there were a lot of discussions. The regulators were also given an opportunity to answer questions. People were asking questions. Our group was about 90 at people in attendance at a hotel and uh, issues really came out. And I must say that it's a, it's a very important issue. It's being given priority even in our um, walk towards vision 2030. As a country, we have a strategy that we are using. We call it the National Development Strategy One. And digital economy is being given a limelight. It's one of the priorities uh, of our country to say we want to, you know, to develop our economy uh, on the digital platform so that we don't leave anyone behind. So the, you know, the issues were related to say, Let's not leave anyone behind. Let's, let's be all inclusive. Let's include all consumers so that consumers can benefit. Uh, the livelihoods can develop in a better way. And uh, we move together with the global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rose. That's a very um, important message there, and particularly about not leaving people behind, either because they're not able to get access and it's, for me, the really important message I got from you there was about the insurance that government actually do actually help 
the consumer bodies to actually put this in in an appropriate way. So I'd now yeah, like yeah, perhaps, perhaps let me also add that um, when I made my presentation, we we requested the Ministry of ICT to educate consumer groups, and they immediately gave it a thumb up. So they have committed to train consumers in computers because many people do not know how to use computers. Yeah. They don't know how to navigate on the digital platforms. So they, are, they have offered to, to assist with that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that came across in some of the other presentations around education, ensuring the appropriate messages. And also and during Nora's presentation, she talked about the actual um, importance of trust. So consumers have to have trust in the products that they're having. And on that basis, I now want to actually move over to Brian. Brian, you've been very patient. Thank you very much for this. Brian leads the mobile money team at GSMA, global organization from the mobile ecosystem. Brian, consumer trust, we've just been talking about there, is one of the key elements for any business and business models that want to access the benefits of mobile money for consumers and companies. How can businesses actually address that consumer trust and the issues that arise, the risks that arise, and what do regulators and other policy makers, we've heard here from the regulator ourselves here and also other businesses, what can they and what do they need to do to ensure that the environment supports innovation and consumer needs? Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, let me first just say that um, I work for the Mobile Money Programme which um, focuses on working or assisting mobile money uh, providers in you know, tackling some of their policy and regulatory challenges, as well as in scaling their mobile money services. I think um, consumer trust uh, is something that has gone hand in hand with the mobile industry in general. Um, we all trust mobile operators with the, with the privacy of our messages. So these are tenets which have been carried on through to, um, to mobile money services. I think mobile, the mobile industry generally um, has laid an emphasis on transparency and disclosure. And we've had a lot from, um, from other speakers on, 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 on what's been happening in their um, in this, uh, sectors or even as regulators. Um, they also place a lot of emphasis on consumer redress uh, mechanisms. Um, there are very good examples of um, how mobile providers, mobile money providers have um, embedded transparency and disclosure in their products and services. I think we've heard from Laura on what um, Vodacom, Vodafone is doing. Um, I think there are other examples of, um, of how operators have embedded their, um, the best practices of transparency and disclosure in their products and services. Um, and the same goes for consumer redress mechanisms. Um, you know, and, and these, these are handled at, at various levels at, at um, consumer touch points, whether this is at the retail outlets or even at agent um, outlets, where the agent who does, in the, who does the cash in and cash out um, also plays a role in, um, in, in supporting consumers with um, any kind of redress concerns that they may have, um, at least in helping them escalate those redress concerns. Um, I think the industry is also, um, uh, you know, recognizes the importance of, of consumer protection and um, came up with a mobile money code of conduct um, a few years ago, which eventually developed into what we call the mobile money certification, the GSMA mobile money certification. And when the code of conduct first came up, we had uh, virtually all major uh, mobile money groups uh, sign up to the code of conduct or even endorse it. Um, and subsequently, we've seen quite a number of mobile money providers um, go through the certification process. And this certification process is really all about um, laying your emphasis on uh, consumer protection, uh, fraud prevention, um, data protection, privacy, and so on. So these are some of the things that the industry is doing. I think there's also um, a huge emphasis on uh, fraud management and prevention. Um, just by illustration, you have um, operators in, in, there's an operator in India, Bati Airtel, which came up with a product known as um, Airtel SafePay, which provides an additional layer of um, payment validation 
um, for two-factor authentication. Now, this was done specifically to address, um, um, you know, fraud, uh, or at least for, for fraud prevention. Um, mobile money providers are also um, working hand in hand with their regulators and other stakeholders in the markets to kind of map out the, the various fraud typologies. Um, in some cases, even going as, um, as far as, as blacklisting known fraudsters. So if a particular mobile number associated with a mobile money account um, has frequently been reported as a fraudulent, you know, as, as a perpetrator of fraud, then such numbers are, are placed in a, in a blacklist. Um, I think it's also important to mention that um, the industry works closely with the, um, with the public sector with the regulators and, and other government um, agencies um, in um, financial education or financial literacy campaigns. Um, and we have examples from that as well um, for many other markets. I think in Pakistan, you have an example of Jazz Cash, which partnered with the State Bank of Pakistan in promoting financial literacy amongst the youth um, through an interactive game um, which was developed under the State Bank of Pakistan's uh, National Financial Literacy um, Program. So th these kind of campaigns are useful in delivering the message to, you know, to the last mile to, to those customers of these um, mobile money uh, providers. And lastly, I think um, Laura also alluded to this. It's important that um, it, you know, consumer protection and privacy are embedded in the design of these products. Um, um, we've heard about you know, statements like uh, privacy by design, where these measures are embedded in the design process of the, of the product, as opposed to um, um, you know, embedding consumer protection or privacy concerns as an afterthought after the product has been developed. So it's important that these things are done prior to the development um, of the product and as the product is being developed. This is just a few illustrations of, of, of how uh, businesses are working with them, um, you know, on, in, in enhancing consumer trust. In terms of uh, what the regulators are doing, I think I've given the example of, um, um, of the State Bank of Pakistan's um, National Financial Literacy Program and working with the providers there. We have examples of um, um, other central banks, for instance, Central Bank of Kenya, which um, years ago um, worked with the industry to enhance um, um, you know, consumer financial literacy on the features of currency. A lot of the time, there might be counterfeit currency that's going around, um, and most ordinary people, even the agents themselves, may not be very familiar with what um, a counterfeit or a genuine kind of currency look, note looks like. So, um, you know, being able to work with industry to um, educate them on the known as well as the hidden features of these currencies, or genuine currencies, I think is important. Um, and even making tools available, whether it's uh, UV lights and so on, available to agents, um, just so that they know um, what um, you know, um, genuine currency notes look like. Um, I know they're not speaking here, but the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, which is an association of um, regulators and public sector actors who are committed to financial inclusion um, has also played a lot, a big role in um, enhancing dialogue between um, their members, the regulators, and the private sector, and especially in some of these topics of uh, consumer financial literacy, uh, consumer financial education, and, and so on. So um, there, there is a role for regulators to play, a big role, and probably probably speak about this later on, um, 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 to collaborate uh, with private sector in um, driving the best uh, practices for consumer protection. Thank you very much, Brian. Actually, I'm gonna start there, if that's okay with you. Let's just really expand on that. And I'd like to really just identify yourself and Maria here. Um, Flora, if you, are, if you want to add anything, then please do. I mean, you talked there about actually financial literacy, but we're also doing about um, talking about protections, aren't we? And transparency and working together. And then you, you finally mentioned about the regulators. Um, I, you know, what are the opportunities for collaborative actions, not only just with the regulators, the businesses, um, the, 
people that are actually on the ground but this is we're talking about it needs education amongst and also consumer groups how can we ensure that we get all of those stakeholders actually working in the, the best way to ensure that the consumers are protected and have the services that they want and i'm thinking here as well as as around um we talked about if something goes wrong how do consumers actually know who to go to to put it right Brian, do you want to do something first there? Yeah, but if you may go first before um, um, Maria. Um, I think uh, I give the illustration of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, which kind of brings together um, financial sector regulators and several private sector um, institutions. But I think this can also be localized. Um, at the local level, there needs to be a recognition first that um, issues such as financial literacy and financial education are a problem or an issue that needs to be dealt with by all, not just by the private sector, not just by the providers of the service, but the regulators have a role to play, the government has a role to play, and even the donor and development community have a role to play in enhancing this. So I think um, what regulators could do is use their, their convening power. You know, when a regulator calls, you you answer. So the, the regulator can use their convening power to kind of bring this, um, the various actors together um, for these kind of discussions. Um, yeah. Maria. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, we have <laughs> a colossal task in front of all of us, I would say. Because we are seeing the development of a new digital ecosystem where we have a very diverse set of financial products. And uh, we have uh, uh, to have uh, the products uh, very much tailored to the different target groups. And obviously, regulators and supervisors, they need to know that market can offer a very diverse set of products. But then we need to discuss which topics should or issues should we put at the top of the agenda of regulators, supervisors, and financial literacy bodies. And I think that um, we need to define a strategy. And the strategy, as Brian said, obviously has to be firstly at national level to acknowledge the importance of financial consumer protection, be it in traditional sectors, traditional way of selling, be it now uh, at the level of this a very, very important and challenging environment, which is the digital environment. Because after the authorities at national level uh, define and accept and acknowledge the importance of financial consumer protection and, and the digital financial consumer protection, then we can learn from each other at the international level. And uh, if you allow me, uh, I'd like to mention that I am very privileged because I, I'm a member of the task force, G20 task force at the OECD level, where regulators meet and discuss issues and uh, financial consumer protection principles, effective approaches, innovative approaches. This is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, within the context of regulators. Then uh, I'm working at FinConnet, and FinConnet itself works very closely with the G20 Task Force on Financial Consumer Protection at OECD. But uh, the FinConnet gathers supervised authorities. Let me mention that supervised authorities are also very important because they are in charge of overseeing the implementation of legal and regulatory framework. And very often, those rights assigned to consumers are very nice, but actually, they not, may not be implemented. Then we have this, uh, this, um, this entity where we can discuss uh, all these topics I mentioned, the digital delivery of consumer credit, uh, payments, even to uh, the use uh, of subtech tools to help financial supervisors. More and more at FinConnect, we have all these topics in our program of work. But then we have at the international level, 
also the role of the International Network on Financial Education. The International Network on Financial Education, obviously hosted and coordinated by the OECD, also develops quite a lot of initiatives related with digital financial literacy. And here, let me share with you that Portugal is now designing a, a digital financial literacy strategy with support of the European Commission and support of the OECD in fee. Because we have been developing different initiatives at national level, raising awareness campaigns to the adoption of uh, strong custom authentication procedures, the two factors of authentication procedures, cybersecurity risks, and so on. And also initiatives targeting youngsters to try to call the attention of this tech savvy <laughs> uh, segment of population for the need to, uh, to be aware of the adoption of safety procedures. But we think there is a need for a comprehensive framework. We which is uh, the need to design a digital financial literacy strategy. And uh, I've been very often uh, working with the, uh, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, uh, and uh, uh, where we have been obviously also uh, uh, very clearly working with them, which means that we have to work together at the international level. And obviously, when we, we need to hear the, the, the consumers' uh, perspectives, we have consumers international. <laughs> Always uh, participating, inviting the perspective of the industry, obviously, and obviously consumers, which means that cooperation is needed. It's essential. Benchmarking is essential also at the international, at international level. I think we need to learn from each other and very fast because we need to, as, as Rose was saying, uh, that uh, we, we need to not to leave consumers behind. But uh, I would say that uh, regulators and supervisors, we, they cannot be behind the curve. We need to learn from each other to adopt the, the most adequate um, uh, framework, obviously at national level, but we need to learn. This is also my experience since uh, 2007, when I was assigned this task at the Bank of Portugal, I've been learning from, from all of you, and I think this is a great message. We need Fantastic. to learn. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you. There are. Sorry, I'd like to just, sorry, I was talking to myself. I often do that. Um, I just like that's absolutely on, like where we want to go, but I'd like to now switch to uh, Rose and Laura. Um, Laura, uh, Rose, just starting with you, we've actually had a specific question that's come through from the audience and just asking about any specific examples of how consumer associations about being able to collaborate with providers or regulators to use their unique knowledge to influence product design. And then Laura, I'd like you then to may maybe talk to us a little bit about um, when you're looking at product design, we're talking about that, you said you'd come back to that question then later is, you know, are there any issues that you've addressed around connectivity? And in particular, maybe when we talk about mobile monies, any issues around loss of mobile phones? So, so I'll start with you, Rose. So about any examples on consumer sort of collaborations that you've been involved in? Thank you very much, Anne. Um, and thank you for the, the question that has just come up. Uh, let me let me say that um, at the level of the Consumer Association, Consumer Council of Zimbabwe, we've managed to lobby with um, mobile money service providers and also the regulator, uh, Postal and Telecommunications Regulatory Authority, where we were lobbying to say that um, um, they should work together. The service providers should work together to cut down on certain costs. So these were interoperability issues where we were saying some of them were actually putting infrastructure. In, in fact, all of them were putting infrastructure, which was almost exactly the same. Uh, for example, you would find that they would dig and install cables you know, cables in, in certain uh, residential areas. So one, one service provider uh, digs the land, they put a cable, another one does exactly the same, just, you know, neighboring in the same locality. And we were lobbying for a long time to say they should 
you know, operate, there should be interoperability where they put just one cable and they all use that same one. One, it will have um, a positive impact to our environment. It will also have a positive impact on the pocket of the consumer because these are unnecessary costs for the consumer. So it's very important that service providers work together as much as possible when it is, uh, when it is possible. So we've already started um, seeing some of the benefits because now um, the regulator then really enforced that and they have started working together in certain places. So this Thank is an example. Much, of I'm gonna, sorry, Bose, I'm just gonna, because we're getting quite close to actually the, uh, coming to the end of our session. I'd really like to give Laura an opportunity just to, to come back with what we were talking about there. Laura, do you have any thoughts on the question that I raised? Uh, have we lost? Sorry. Oh, with I can't uh, can't hear Laura at the moment, so I think we've just missed Laura. So what I'd like to do is we're coming to the end of our session. We, uh, there's a really um, good question. Yeah, I mean, so I think I think Laura, we've um, you've got some connectivity issues there. So I think we're going to have to leave that question at the pro moment. I've got. One, I've got two minutes or one minute each person. If you can think about actually what you would take away from today, and then I'll sum up, summarize what we've discussed. But there is a question around um, loss and theft of mobiles. So, if, if Brian, if you could if, think about maybe doing some of that. So, Maria, just one thought from today's discussion, if you want just to take away. The need for cooperation at international Co level. Cooperation. Rose, one thought from you. Consumer education is very key. Let's not leave consumers behind. Let's walk with them into this technology, the digital technology. Fantastic. Brian, one thought from you, and maybe you can use anything about the loss of mobile phones. Yes. Um, I'd also say collaboration is important um, and the need for, you know, balance regulation. I think that was raised by Maria Lucia. Um, on theft of mobile phone, I, I really don't think that theft of a mobile phone should lead to loss of, of the money in the wallet because um, that money is protected by a PIN. Um, so unless you already know the PIN, the customer, then theft of the phone um, should not lead to loss of the funds. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brian. Laura, have we got you back or are you still got, got some connectivity issues? I don't know. Can you hear me? Ah, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes, we can. I, I was going to echo what Brian said to that question. I also typed it in. But yeah, I think the, the key thing is um, to be hearing, like we hear from consumers a lot, but the more we do hear the top concerns of consumers, it enables us to bring it better into our product design. So um, yeah, open to, to more of that collaboration um, piece. And I think more that we can work across industry. Um, I think Rose pointed some examples out, but we're also trying to work uh, much more across industry um, to see if there's things we can do, particularly on some data sharing in the, the lending side um, to try and risk reduce exposure for our customers and, and over indebtedness that doesn't help any single player. It only um, impacts the whole. Brilliant, absolutely. I guess I've got, I had three um, summaries from here and I've got some others as well, but I, I'll just talk about this. So what we've got here is um, the key messages we've had. I mean, you've, you've summed it up lovely. We had cooperation, collaboration, education, balance regulation, et cetera. All of those are absolutely key. I've got it in slightly longer words so that we can actually then put that slightly <laughs> out there. So I've got uh, digital financial service that enabled more people to access an important element, um, their money in a way we mustn't leave anyone behind. Um, and that's across all sorts of um, countries. Consumer protection and empowerment must be at the core of anything we do and should drive innovation. Trust is a key element here. And 
All our panels have rec panelists have recognised the important role of establishing dialogues and synergies across all of the consumers, consumer advocates, all of the stakeholders involved here. You cannot do it alone. You need appropriate regulation, as Maria. I have seen bad regulation, but when it works, it works really well. You need consumer bodies to actually then translate what's actually being said. It's very complex to the end users. You absolutely need the mobile providers to work together because you do need that core element so that if something goes wrong, someone knows where they can go to and what that means. And Laura, I'm really pleased to hear some of the innovations that you and your company are doing around understanding and building products that are actually built on what the consumer wants rather than what we think they want, and particularly around lending. So I've summarised it up more than I wanted to, but I think it's been an absolutely very good debate, really interesting, happy to take any other questions later on. I think at this stage, I'm now going to just hand over to Antoninino. Just to thank you, uh, you and all the speakers, and uh, please stay tuned. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have a whole week of events, so if you want to go to Consumers International webpage, then you can find uh, the program, and also Matt put a link in the chat. Thank you very much, all. Have a great Work Consumers Right Day, and see you soon. <laughs>